Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Rebecca Shirley. I'm the Director for Research, Data, and Innovation at the World Resources Institute. And the World Resources Institute is an independent research institute working at the intersections of global environmental and developmental challenges across the world. We've been working in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, China, South, um, Southeast Asia for the past 40 years, um, working with partners to run global platforms on everything from energy to food and climate change. I'm so thankful to our organizers, Fable and AFSEC for this time together today. Um, and we're going to be talking about food systems. Currently, food and land use practices, consumer behaviors, and the very nature of our local and global food supply chains have created a situation across many countries of unsustainable food systems with large impacts to the environment, to health, and to perpetuated and deepening inequality. In the last 60 years, the world population has more than doubled. And so meeting the food demand for this growing population in the ways that those with decision-making power have allowed has come at high cost of environmental degradation. The global food system generates almost two, one third of the global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And according to IPCC, agricultural lands now cover approximately 43% of the world's ice and desert-free areas. And over 80% of that agricultural production constitutes food. Now, studies have shown that meeting the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement objectives are possible with decisive government action. And decisive government action, as we all know, that is a very complex area, particularly for policymakers who face the pressure of prioritizing short-term results and long-term goals, um, or those policymakers who are under geopolitical or donor pressure from other countries. So integrated approaches that link agriculture, biodiversity, climate, and diets are crucial to ensuring that short-term policymaking can support longer-term food transition goals, such as the Paris Agreements and the SDGs. Now, scientists are supporting policymakers in adopting a long-term approach through integrated assessments. Integrated, integrated assessments are really important tools. They can help governments anticipate, assess, and manage the trade-offs between the different land pressures and align shorter-term strategies with longer-term ambitions. And notably, they can help support countries in integrating food systems and biodiversity conservation and restoration into their broader climate strategies. So today, we're going to have scientists from across South Africa, Mexico, and India sharing with us on their experience. Their work with governments to ensure policy coherence across food and land use sectors and how they're able to help policymakers align climate and biodiversity strategies with the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. We're in, treat, we're in for a real treat today because the presentations are going to showcase how scientists critically assess synergies and trade-offs from transforming food and land use systems focusing on equity and resilience. In a discussion that we'll moderate after the panelists are able to speak, we will learn how to strengthen the science policy interface so that existing evidence can be effectively inform, can be used to effectively inform policy and better use science to support the transition to sustainable, more inclusive and more resilient food systems. And so in total today, we're going to be discussing how we can really catalyze food systems transformation to achieve the SDGs. Now, where the continent where population growth rates will be greatest over the next three decades is here in Sub-Saharan Africa. And according to the IPCC, Africa is one of the most vulnerable continents to climate change and climate variability, largely because of a strong economic reliance on agriculture and its climate dependent nature. Our yields here are already relatively low compared to other regions and the IPCC projects that climate induced yield reductions are highly likely this century, which will then have knock on effects on Africa's competitiveness and patterns of regional and international trade. So without any further ado, let me first introduce our keynote speaker, who will tell us about this very situation and the latest in science policy successes for Sub-Saharan Africa. Let me introduce you all to Mr. John Paul Adam, who's the Director for Technology, Climate Change and Natural Resources Management at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Previously, John Paul has served in the government of the Republic of Seychelles as a Minister of Health, a Minister of Foreign Affairs and a Minister of Finance, Trade and the Blue Economy, where through all of those positions, he advocated for the concept of blue economy, 
negotiated a debt for climate change adaptation swap, and launched the process for Seychelles to become the first issuer of a blue bond globally. So John Paul is very well placed to speak to us about the science policy intersection and the very interlinked nature of our challenges around food production. John Paul, let me pass over to you for our keynote speech. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, and uh, greetings to everyone uh, from Seychelles where I'm currently uh, speaking. Uh, first of all, it's uh, a great pleasure and honor uh, to express the greetings of Dr. Vera Songwe, the Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to say a few words on her behalf, particularly because when we talk about food, we are going to the very essence of sustainable development. If we cannot address the issue of zero hunger, we will never also address the issue of net zero in terms of emissions. So the UNECA is pleased to co-host this side event where we aim to particularly build on the experiences at country level to develop pathways that can also change the global food policy debate. And this is obviously part of the science days for the United Nations Food Systems Summit 2021 together with the Food, Agriculture, Biodiversity, Land Use and Energy Consortium, or FABLE, and the Food Systems Economics Commission. We're delighted with this partnership, and I think it's these types of partnership that can help us move the needle on policies. We're hopeful also to, we look forward also to the Food System Economics Commission report that they are developing to address the standard economics of food, sustainability, emerging vulnerabilities, and food system level risks. So today's session, as has already been mentioned, will highlight the work that scientists are doing and perhaps more importantly, how we can make sure that those messages are addressed by policymakers and can make a difference in daily lives. The COVID-19 pandemic has underlined the fact that a new model of economic development is needed to be able to get back on track to achieve the sustainable development goals. Most critically, we also need a model that solves the climate crisis. While COVID-19 has provided an unprecedented shock to the global economy, climate change has also been slowly eroding at the socioeconomic gains we have made. And the ECA has calculated that African countries are spending on average 5% of GDP per annum to respond to climate disasters. And in some scenarios in the future, the climate change may cost some African countries up to 15% of their GDP by 2030. The COVID crisis and the climate crisis are underlying factors which will exacerbate food, food insecurity. COVID-19 is estimated to have dramatically increased people facing acute food insecurity in, in the last year. And the World Food Programme estimates that 272 million people are already or at risk of becoming acutely food insecure in the countries where it operates. The latest Africa Regional Overview of Food Security and Nutrition 2020 report states that the overall progress in meeting global nutrition targets remains unacceptably slow in Africa. And Sub-Saharan Africa is the only region in the world where the number of stunted children continues to rise. The Food and Agriculture Organization and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa report calls for the transformation of agri-food systems to ensure healthy diets are more affordable for people in Africa. So it's not only about food being produced, it's also about how it's distributed and how we can make sure that the most needy people have access, not only to calories, but to food that truly allows them uh, to build a sustainable future for themselves and for their families. The United Nations Economic Commission for Africa also earlier this year released a report on a green recovery for Africa which has shown very clearly that investing in energy, food security, and nature-based solutions bring the best return in terms of jobs created and in terms of value addition throughout the economy. In a case study in the Republic of South Africa, it was shown that investing in these green sectors brought a return of 250% in terms of jobs created and 420% in terms of the multiplier effects across the economy as compared to investing in similar fossil fuel based investments. So science based evidence and options are vital in achieving healthy diets, efficient, inclusive, resilient and sustainable food systems, essential for increased human health and ecological sustainability. 
ECA's assessments have shown that African staples may see drops of up to 22% in yields by 2050 due to climate change. And as Rebecca already mentioned, we already have lower yields than many other regions in the world. So climate smart agricultural practices can help reduce environmental impact at the local level while also contributing at the global level. And climate smart agricultural practices are also about building resilience at the point uh, at the community level to ensure that climate change can be resisted. We need to build this science-based approach into our trading systems and therefore prioritizing food security. We have a great opportunity to do so with the African continental free trade area. And we need through the AFCFTA to prioritize investments which are allowing the growth of large scale agro industry, but also empowering medium, small uh, micro enterprises. We can strengthen a rules-based system which emphasizes sustainability and builds climate resilience. We can also look to how nature-based solutions can strengthen our ability to produce food while also rehabilitating the environment. It is obvious that all African leaders have already made a commitment that we have to uh, build forward better, that we can't keep doing things the way we have been doing it in the past. The big challenge is how do we make that change? If everyone recognizes that there is a better return in relation to green investments, how do we flip that switch? There are, there are obviously huge considerations in terms of the availability of financing. And one of the big questions in COP26 will be how we can channel affordable financing into food systems and how this can be done in a way which truly ensures that the most vulnerable are, uh, are uh, supported and their resilience is improved. 2021 could be the super year for sustainable land use and food systems. The 2021 UN Biodiversity Conference uh, in COP15, the UN Food Systems Summit, the United Nations Climate Change Conference at COP26, all of these events provide a great opportunity to increase the level of ambition, raise the profile of land use and food systems, and to critically accelerate the implementation of integrated strategies. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to share these thoughts, and we look forward to the debate and the recommendations. Thank you, and back to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, John Paul, uh, for those fantastic and very inspiring reflections on how I like the phrase, how to flip the switch, how to channel policy and affordable financing into food systems transformation. Now, one of the things that you talked about just now was the role of both smallholder farmers, SMEs and large scale agriculture. I thought this was really important because I think that we oftentimes, um, you know, don't think about the spread of actors that are, that are at play here. Um, and it's really important to understand the distributional effects of international and regional trade rules. And indeed, you brought that up as one of the opportunities as rules based systems that prioritize sustainability. Of course, we're all aware of, of AFTA, the Africa Free Trade Agreement that is now um, uh, being operationalized. Could you explain for us and just unpack that, 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 re that recommendation that you had a bit earlier? Could you explain for us the ways in which AFTA trade rules and market liberalization more broadly, of course, may impact national trade balances and smallholder welfare and could be used as an opportunity for securing and safeguarding smallholder farmers in particular. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. And I think one of the main um, underpinnings of, uh, of development in recent years has been that trade uh, should be able to improve uh, the livelihoods of, of all citizens. The reality is that that has been possible in some cases, uh, but if there is not intervention and appropriate policy and regulation, then you end up in a race to the bottom rather than a race to the top. Uh, and we can see that around um, Africa's successes as well as Africa's limitations. So Africa has actually achieved a lot um, following the Millennium Development Goals. Um, the, uh, a huge swath of populations in Africa have been uh, dragged out of poverty. Uh, we've seen unprecedented levels of economic growth, but that level, level that uh, economic growth has um, is not uh, does not provide the resilience that we need, and we've seen this in the pandemic. So, for example, if we take uh, the over reliance on commodity exports and uh, and uh, extractive industries, 
uh, we can note that about it, just pre pre pandemic about 11% of Africa's exports uh, were from the extractive sector, uh, but they they represented less than 1% of employment. Uh, so we see that there's not necessarily been that uh, that translation of the economic growth uh, into support for the most vulnerable. And we've also seen that within countries that have been broadly successful, so countries that are now classified as uh, middle income or even upper middle income, you still have large numbers of the population that are uh, living very precariously and are very vulnerable. And this is not being properly captured uh, through the models of trade, which are based on what I would call uh, a, a focus on uh, a focus on, let's say, going towards the cheapest products, but not necessarily looking at the infrastructure, for example, for distribution, and not looking also at the impact that this has on communities. So the AFCFTA, uh, the opportunity that we have is firstly through regulation uh, to set standards, uh, and that would, in some instances, for example, prevent dumping, which we've seen in Africa, where you've got you've had situations where large amounts of cheap products that have suddenly become available halfway across the world that can be shipped very quickly. And suddenly uh, the local chicken farmer in a small town uh, is, is no longer competitive because you suddenly have this large amount of chicken which has been flooded uh, onto the market. The FCFTA should provide uh, guarantees and, uh, uh, and certainty for all levels of producers. And that includes the small producer that has maybe less flexibility, but is depending on that market access as well as the larger uh, agro-industrial uh, operators that, that have a key part to play in reaching the food security goals uh, and uh, across the continent, but have the security as well to invest in the long-term knowing that they're not going to be undermined. And that's uh, a question. So, so the, uh, the way of looking at an efficient market and factoring that into the AFCFTA is to factor in climate resilience from the outset. And that means looking at uh, how does the, the rules that we are setting, how does, do those contribute towards sustainable value chains, uh, which starts from the producer at the local level uh, and the impact that this has on the environment. Uh, and there's, uh, there are real opportunities to do so. There are some very positive examples already around a number of commodities. And I think by, uh, by uh, baking this into the uh, AFCFTA cake right from the outset, will have a, a much a much more successful outcome. That was a brilliant answer. I was here scrambling down notes. I really enjoyed um, those reflections, um, Jean-Paul, and the very concrete examples and suggestions of ways that we can provide security and, and certainty for both smallholder farmers and our large scale um, uh, agricultural uh, stakeholders as well. Um, thank you so much for both of those reflections through your, your, your keynotes talk and the answer to that question. I know that you will have to leave us at some point during today's session, so let me just say my thanks up top for, for setting us off on such a great, um, for giving us such a great broad landscape to begin with. Now, without further ado, I want to turn over to the panel session of, of today's, um, of today's uh, webinar. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're going to speak to three scientists in order about their work at this science and policy interface um, in, their, in their respective countries. Let me first introduce you all to uh, Dr. Odirilwe Selomin, who is a researcher at the Center for Sustainability Transitions at Stellenbosch University and the lead of the Fable South Africa team. He's also the director of the Program on Ecosystems Change and Society, or PEX, which is an international network of researchers working on socio-ecological systems. So Dr. Odi, let me please pass the floor over to you to give us your talk about what's happening in South Africa. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, just a moment while I share my screen. Is that right? Absolutely, yes, you are good to go. Thanks, Shelly. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Shelly has already mentioned, my name is Odi. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to be speaking here today and um, also looking forward to the discussions later. Uh, today, I'll be talking very briefly about the, the pathways for food and land systems here in South Africa as part of the, the Fable Consortium that 
both Shelley and um, Jean Paul mentioned earlier. Um, just for a, a bit of context, the um, just like any other country, South Africa is also trying to balance its uh, national development targets, objectives uh, with the multi multilateral agreements, which is for the uh, Paris Agreement, Sustainable Development Goals, the Convention of Biological Diversity, uh, Global Biodiversity Framework. At the same time, also trying to balance the multiple um, objectives, policy objectives here at home. Uh, for example, for food security, biodiversity protection, and, um, and climate change. So for this to be done, um, well, there's multiple ways to do this, but one of the useful tools to do this is um, um, to use integrative tools that are able to assess both the trade-offs and, and synergies of this uh, policy decisions. And um, the tool I'll be talking about uh, particularly today is the Fable Calculator, which offers help with doing this integrated assessment. And it is focusing particularly on the uh, on the role of uh, agriculture, forestry, and other land uses uh, sectors, and how they contribute uh, generally to the uh, to meeting these targets. Right. So we start here by asking how these sectors uh, can contribute to meeting these targets, and in in doing so, we develop two pathways. Uh, obviously, there's many pathways, but as a as an illustration, we develop two pathways. One we call the current trends, and the other we call it uh, sustainable pathways. And the, the, the current path, current trends is a, a pathway which really does the minimum in implementing the uh, the, the policies. So it's uh, it's basically staying on the course as uh, it's going today. The sustainable pathway, on the other hand, assumes implementation of several of the policies that are currently in place, as well as other aspirational ones that are maybe uh, at the moment beyond the, the, uh, what is planned in, in the current uh, policy ambitions. The difference between these two is the adjustment of, uh, of certain parameters that I will show you in a moment. And we look at this between the span of a, a particular current period um, and looking at that in context to 2050. So how does that look now and in the future? The uh, pathways were defined by this parameter. So we look at population growth, um, agricultural expansion, protected area expansion, uh, crop and livestock productivity, imports and exports. Um, John Paul mentioned trade earlier, and we'll talk a bit about the implications of this in a moment. Uh, diet and waste, uh, uh, biofuels and climate change. And for each of these, they can either decline, uh, they can increase, or they can stay the same. So an example, population will increase, uh, of course, uh, but something like biofuels here in South Africa is not a, a major uh, sector. So it's unlikely to grow very much. So it's likely to stay the same as an example. Um, just some ex uh, oh, oh, to illustrate with some, a few, few examples uh, of what we are finding um, from our modeling exercise. Uh, one of the key findings is that obviously land use is a, a key driver of, um, of emissions reduction. So if you look at the figure on your left, you will see the, the light green area is um, an area of, of uh, pasture, um, which is very dominant if you look at the, the on both those figures, green is a very dominant, uh, light green is a dominant um, use. This is um, pastures for, for livestock. Um, as some of you might know, we are a big meat eater as a country here. Um, and so if we look at the, the sustainable option or the sustainable alternatives to this current pathway, there's a, a uh, at least from 2030 onwards, there's a big decline in, uh, in pastures. And what this translates to, uh, as the this is obviously driven by changes in diet, but what this translates to, if you look at the figure on your right, is that the um, there's a quite a high reduction in emissions. And between these two, the, the current current between both in both the current and sustainable pathways, we we are seeing reductions in emissions. 
Um, but that's especially the case in, in, in the sustainable pathways. And part of that is obviously as a result of one, the, the production in future meat, meat, uh, meat production, as well as the land that is being freed up to become a carbon sink that is uh, uh, contributing to this reduction in emissions. Um, so why is that the case? Uh, as I've already uh, indicated, this is uh, as a result of diet changes. So for the two um, pathways that we're, we're presenting, you can see that in the, in the current pathway, uh, meat, uh, red meat consumption and, um, and, and poultry are still big contributors, uh, or they still form a big part of the diet, um, as you'll see on the figure on the, on the left. And there's a, a reduction when you look at the figure on the right in, in um, um, red meat consumption as well as poultry, and an increase in, in pulses. So, so you see a reduction in meat-based uh, protein use in, in diet, uh, an increase in plant-based um, uh, protein sources. Um, but the, this diet change has also other implications other than, um, or, or the results of, of, of diet changes has also other implications. So for example, when we look at what this means for trade in South Africa, uh, between the, the current trends and sustainable pathways, we see a three times increase in, um, in, in trade surplus. And this is mainly driven by an increase in, in exports. So high value, high, high value products such as uh, fruits and a decrease in imports of mainly meat products. And as, as you can see, these are uh, obviously the, the import of meat, meat products and, and meat is contributing a lot to South Africa's uh, emissions profile. So reducing those as a result of diet shift also means a uh, reduction in those uh, emissions. But one uh, important uh, thing to keep in mind for a country like South Africa is that uh, changing to a healthy diet has a lot of implications and, and, and also faces a lot of challenges. One of which is that um, we are a very unequal country with a lot of poverty and, and food insecurity. Um, so the recent there's a recent study looking at the impact of, of COVID-19, for example, showed just over 50% of, of households losing their source of um, uh, income to buy food. So while diet changes are really a, a big leverage uh, um, to, to what the sustainable pathways, uh, it becomes important to think about them in, in, in a particular context, such as ours, where a change from uh, what, what I call the normal diet or the current diet to, to the future one would require um, both the consideration that uh, people are currently scrambling for just the basic food access. So the question of changing diet becomes uh, almost unreachable for most people. And um, that the, this will, with the, the change should also be followed by um, a subsequent change in, in, in planting the right crops that we need that are currently not part of our uh, production profile, or if they are, they're still very small. So in, in conclusion, this models needs to, going forward, uh, models like ours, uh, the ones we built here, need to really consider this inequality um, as um, an important consideration um, for the for context such as ours here in South Africa. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much and um, looking forward to, to discussing with you in, in a moment. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Odi. And you actually finished ahead of time, uh, which is unusual <laughs> for, for webinars. So thank you so much for that. Let me ask you one quick question before we move on to the next panelist, actually, since we have some time. You had a brilliant slide with your current versus sustainable diets. It was the concentric circles um, chart. I was wondering if you could go that through for us a little bit more slowly. You kind of talked about what the difference would really look like for South Africa diets, current versus sustainable. Could you walk us through that again? Yes, do, do you want me to show the slide again or just talk through if it? If you'd like, or you can just talk us through it, either one. Right, so the, the, for the two um, 
if you remember the one on the on the left was called the current trend. So this is based on basically projections of what we will need to, uh, for our diets in the future based on what we eat now already. The sustainable diet, on the other hand, is uh, implementing a, a, a is implementing a a, a healthy diet, with, uh, which is recommended by the Eat Lancet Forum, and the, this is mainly advocating for reduction in red meat um, red meat consumption, as well as a general increase in plant based um, protein sources. So, for those two cycles, we see a slight reduction, uh, um, well, a significant reduction in in poultry, which goes within sort of the recommended maximum that we should be using and a, a, a reduction which doesn't get all the way under the boundary but uh, it's significant enough to 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 result in um, essentially to free up land that is useful both for, for biodiversity uh, as well as for for emissions uh, sequestration carbon sequestration rather brilliant thank uh, you I thought that was so interesting that it's not actually a full um uh cancelling out of, of various meats but really just coming down to required maximums anyway um so i thought that was quite interesting um and we will be coming back to after we've gone through the other panels we'll come back and ask some more specific questions about about the 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 science and the modeling and the challenges that you faced in pulling this um in pulling this analysis together let me move on in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Odi. In the meantime, let me move on to our second panelist, um, Dr. Charlotte Gonzalez. Uh, Charlotte is a researcher at the Conservación de Ter Territorio Insular Mexicano, or ISLA. Her research focuses on understanding the differences of farming practices across Mexico's ecoregions and their change through time. She's also the lead of Fable Mexico, uh, the Mexico team. Uh, which is formed by a multidisciplinary group of scientists with experience working at government institutions across health, land, and food systems. So Charlotte, let me pass over to you for your talk about what's happening in Mexico. Hi, thank you so much, Rebecca. A pleasure to be here. Just let me share my screen. Um, um, Okay, can you see it? Can you hear me? Not yet, we're not seeing a screen yet. Not yet, it seems that there is a problem sharing my screen. Just a second, please. Sure, and in the meantime, let me say to our participants, we've got some 80 something on the on the webinar on the call. Thank you so much for joining us. Please feel free to drop your questions in the chat or in the Q&A box in the middle of your screen, um, where as you'll see our panelists are ready and able to answer your questions. Dr. Odi is already answering a direct question that was asked about his study. So, so feel free to drop your questions there. Charlotte, you we can see your screen now, are you oh. ready? Excellent. I'm ready. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Charlotte Gonzalez. Um, I work at ISLA as an independent researcher. And I'm going to talk about um, how the Mexican pathways to sustainable land use and food system have been developed and how we have been coordinated with some uh, federal institutions in Mexico to show our work and try to um, cement a collaboration with them that we think it might be mutually uh, helpful. Um, so Mexico. Mexico is a mega diverse country, culturally and biologically speaking. Um, we have a strong environmental law, but it's in paper. That means that we have very uh, protective laws, very interesting laws, um, environmentally speaking, but most of them are not applied in, in reality, but they are in paper. So um, that usually is a problem and a, a, a frustration, a constant frustration. Um, despite that, that it seems that Mexico is a tropical country. It is not. Uh, two thirds of the country are dry lands, and that limits our ability to produce food in most of those areas. Um, however, there are some pockets of agriculture here in these arid areas, arid areas that are highly productive, um, but they rely on underground water storage that takes millennia to replenish. Irrigation agriculture in here is practiced 
Um, but we have a problem that some radiation evapotranspiration is so high that is depleting and salinizing soils really fast. So these areas who are uh, very productive pockets of agriculture with some of the highest yields uh, for food production in the country are also the ones who have been um, depleting faster and salinizing soils faster and depleting our water storage. Um, most of the country drylands have been used for cattle ranching for centuries, and many of them have suffered intense biological changes as a result. Cattle ranching, cattle is left unattended in most of those areas, and that obviously has created some um, intense changes in these ecosystems. Um, we have at least 6 million um, our, um, hectares of agricultural um, in, agric in agricultural areas that are in need of restoration for, reco for recovery, not only in the drylands, not only in those areas um, of, the, of the north part of the country where the aridity is more present, but also in the southern part, which have been completely depleted. Um, in 2008, the national mean yield of the most important uh, crop in Mexico, maize, um, was 3.2 tons, tons per hectare. Um, that means that in some places of the country, we have 12 tons of, of production per hectare, but in others, we have less than one ton per hectare. Um, now, if we see on the health side, um, we have a problem. Seven of 10 people are obese or overweighted. 27% of preschool children are micronutrient deficient, percent micronutrient deficiency, and 12% of school children. The population diet had been evolving rapidly due to urbanization. In, in the 1970s, more than half of our population was already living in cities. Um, and that with um, high incomes in the cities had increased the amount of animal proteins that are um, up eat by, that by these urban populations uh, with other processed food. And this, inten um, intensifying, this is intensifying the pressure on Mexico agricultural systems and ecosystems. We also have challenges on ensuring consistency of public policy. There's a difficulty to coordinate vertically between the federation, the states and the municipalities, but also challenges on horizontal communication between ministries. And we have um, other opportunities and also, also another challenge is because we are part of the United States, Mexico and Canada agreement, and they are our main market of fresh products. So all these um, problems are problems that are not from just one sector. It's not an agricultural problem. It's not an environmental problem. It's not a health problem. It's a multi-sectoral problem. Um, it's a very complex problem that needs to be addressed by all sectors and on all levels of government. Um, with this problematic in mind, we were asking questions in favor of Mexico, like how can we reduce the impact of land and food systems um, on the environment? Um, can we feed a growing population? Uh, can we have a dietary shift that is equally sustainable, but also a healthy transition that is culturally accepted in Mexico? So, you will think that these are um, very important questions and that the government, the governments in different uh, levels, they are already, they already know it. And they do. They, the problem is well recognized um, by past and current governments. However, the solutions that they have been proposed have been usually implemented in this connection from all the other sectors and from the academia. For example, land and food systems have traditional solutions to improve land productivity given the current demand of the current diets. Um, it hasn't been um, a, a, a solution where there are both things at the same time. Let's imp improve our diets and then let's see what happens with the land and how can, in, how can we improve our production systems. Um, in Mexico, there are at least eight federal institutions responsible for implementing and designing public policy related to land and food systems. And there is a consistent lack of coordination among them. And this is only at the federal system. But if we talk about the state system and the municipal system, there are many institutions that deal with that and they don't talk to each other. Um, fortunately, this political term, um, our current federal government has created a few, a new intersecretarial group that has uh, been 
uh, created on purpose to transform the Mexican land and food, sy food system to be just, healthy, and equitable and sustainable. The name of the intersectoral group is HISAMAC and integrates the ministries of health, environment, agriculture, and economy. So our interest as in Fable Mexico was to collaborate with all of these institutions. Um, and we are especially interested in collaborating with HISAMAC. And for the past two years, we have been working with the National Institute of Public Health and the Ministry of Agriculture to do precisely that, to collaborate with them and to try to reach HISAMAC. So, however, in Mexico, collaboration with public institutions and academia is not, as straight, is not a straightforward process. We first started by identifying a team of researchers that had academic experience in land and food system, and they were willing and um, they wanted to work in, in Fable, Mexico. So we created this group, um, and then we use our personal connections to reach to those government officials in those eight institutions. Some were on board immediately, for example, the Ministry of Agriculture and the Institute for Public Health, um, while others need a little bit more work. Initially, we had a workshop with those institutions. Some of the representatives of those institutions were present, and we prepared and we showed them what our, our work was and our modeling platforms. And they gave us some feedback. That feedback was integrated into our models. And with that, we created two pathways and several scenarios for Mexico reality. This is exactly the same methodology that Odi, my, my colleague that previously presented for South Africa, um, showed us. So basically what we did was <clears throat> with the help of the Ministry of Agriculture, the National Institute for Public Health, uh, part of the Ministry of Environment, we designed two pathways and several scenarios. So we could be, they could be analyzed in an integrative model called the Fable Calculator that examines complex synergies and trade-offs between agriculture, water, land use, biodiversity, diets, greenhouse gas emissions, and greenhouse gas emission policies. We initially focused on current policy and international commitments of Mexico. So basically, what were the trade-offs of implementing them and how much would they contribute to the national and then the global goals for sustainable development? We created two pathways, current trends, which basically shows historical improvements for crops and, and, and livestock, some federal reforestation programs that are current right now since 2018, that the new government started. And we represented or we model the current diets, which basically in Mexico are high on ultra processed foods, fats, sugar, refined cereals, and in urban populations, high uh, um, consumption of meats, red meats. And then we presented a sustainable path, um, which basically improved maize jails using pilot programs um, funded by the government some modern civil pastoral systems that had been tested across the country in, um, by some researchers, a reforestation of 8.4 million hectares by 2050, representing one of the Mexico's commitments, healthy diets and culturally ad adapted diets were generated use, um, by collaboration with the Institute of Health, which basically means more fruits, veggies, legumes, whole cereals, and less fats and sugars. So what happened in here? Well, we, the results of the, our model showed that dietary changes deeply reshapes cropland areas in Mexico compared to current trends. If we compare um, so the sustainable pathway versus, <clears throat> I'm sorry, versus the current pathways, the sustainable pathway just with the dietary changes and improvements on production of uh, with silvopasture, modern silvopastoral practices and with some of the improvements made by the program for maize production, um, it really, um, the, the share of, of areas uh, that are used for agriculture for cereals drops from 40% to 20%. For fruits and veggies, it increases because we need more fruits and veggies for the, the, for the diet that we presented. So it goes from 24 to 40. Some of these changes are explained by exports, which I didn't show because this is not, it's not part of this conversation, but basically what we did is to mimic what already happens. We want to export fruits and veggies because we are really good at it. We have the, the, the correct environments for it and we have our markets already there. 
but we also want to import more meat and more milk so we don't put that much strain on our ecosystems. So what happens in here is that some of these uh, results are explained by exports and imports, but not, not, impo not as, as important as the dietary changes. So what happened is that with the increment of fruits and veggies consumption, it also impacts water demand. More than 50% of more water is needed to produce that much food, uh, that much veggies and, and, um, and fruits. So the implementation of modern civil pastoral system generates a reduction of pasture land, an important increment of land where natural processes predominate. That means that they become carbon sinks as well as abandon, abandon, some of the abandoned agricultural areas that will happen for those uh, areas that were dedicated to cereal production. We also have um, reduction of greenhouse gases. And um, if you can see the, the my graph in here. I don't know if I can show you the graph with my pointer. No. Um, the difference between the two pathways is very important. We have an 89% reduction compared from the current trends uh, if we move towards a sustainable development. So we have basically a reduction of deforestation, a recovery of natural land, reduction in pasture, increase of reforested land, and a reduction of um, some of the green gas. Um, house emissions. So this is mainly using a dietary change and some um, improvement in our food production practices. So fi finally, um, integration of sustainable agricultural practices might increase productivity without an area increment and an important reduction in GHG um, emissions. Our results indicate that it is possible to integrate sustainable agricultural practices that will increase productivity without an area increment. That means Fable that can contribute providing the quantitative tools to analyze the trade-off of those changes. Most land in Mexico is used to produce food for internal consumption. Any changes in diets will impact how the land is used. These might not be the same for other countries, like for example, Argentina or the US, where they not only use their land to feed their own population, but also importantly to feed other countries. The sustainable diet shows how a change in diets with su some sustainable practices improve productivity and can revert pasture lands into carbon sinks. As I told you, most of our arid, arid lands are full of cattle that is left uh, unattended. If we improve those practices, we can dramatically change what is happening to the environment that is being degraded in those areas. HISAMAC represents a cross-cutting mechanism in Mexico that is still untapped. It should be used to put in forward proposals for public policy coordinated between departments. And that these proposals are based on a shared vision represented by exercises like FABLE or FABLE by itself. Basically, we are here to help, we can help, and we are trying to um, cement collaboration with these institutions. And um, with that, Thank you so much for listening. And I'm here if you need anything. Thank you, Charlotte. A really wonderful presentation. Um, I'm already seeing some questions for you that you can probably answer directly in the chat. But we'll come back to this again um, after our third and last presentation once we have, once we get into our, um, our panel uh, question and answer period. So without further ado, let me invite our third speaker. Um, or third panelist, sorry, to, to, um, to start up his screen. And it's going to be Dr. Ranjan Kumar Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh is currently an associate professor at the Center for Management in Agriculture at the Indian Institute of Management uh, in India, and he is the lead coordinator for Fable India. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, over to you to please uh, tell us about your work and your research in India. Okay, thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you, everyone, for giving this opportunity. Uh, it's it's a nice time to share what we have been doing. It's a very important panel, and I'm really grateful for that. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, I'm just going to briefly talk about you know some of the modeling exercises, some of the scientific exercise we have been doing, which to uh, our attention or our knowledge is you know the first time we are trying to look at the impacts of you know the food and land use changes 
and how, and what are the interactions and the role it plays in india's sustainability transitions so uh, next slide if we all uh, you know uh, for those who work on in india and those who would be aware india's co2 emissions may be you know small in compared to you know some other developed countries but it has been steadily increasing over the last few decades uh, and a large share of that close to over 23% comes from agriculture livestock forestry and land use changes and land use sectors india has also made commitments to reduce its emissions intensity by a significant proportion 33 to 35% under the paris agreement and uh, uh, you know uh, but, but at the same time uh, we also know that india's population is projected to be you know increasing and as far as you know, some of the scenarios predict over 1.6 billion by 2050 and that puts a lot of pressure on you know, agricultural production and pressure on land and there is also a predicted move towards more high animal based protein consumption which means dietary shifts under current trends towards uh, more meat consumption and dairy consumption more livestock based consumption which again is an additional pressure on the land and the production agricultural production system uh, next slide please okay so how the question we ask is how will india meet its development and sustainability targets together uh, what we do uh, in uh, in order to attempt to answer some of this you know very very complex uh, questions is to apply you know under the fable consortium as we are working with over 20 countries uh, and you know like other countries we have uh, you know taken part in a synathon which is an exercise where we all come together and integrate our data on a platform and then you know look at you know what are the different pathways so uh, we use a a, a a dynamic model uh, a land use partial equilibrium model called macpy which is developed and hosted at portsum institute of climate change which basically integrates you know specially explicit uh, biophysical factors such as land availability potential crop yields and available water and uh, also it's an economic decision making process with population economic growth we feed that and climate change scenarios as exogenous drivers we use a global uh, modeling uh, platform and then we use it to actually you know downscale it for india and update it for india and then you know we try to create pathways next slide uh, which are uh, basically uh, so so we built on shared socio economic pathways which you know i am sure many of you are already familiar with and very similar to what the mexico team and the south african team did is in terms of having a business as usual current trend scenario where we add to that uh, uh, you know we add eat lancet healthy diet recommendations and then we create a pathway for that and then another is a more ambitious climate high climate achieving pathway which we call as sustainable pathways and some of and most of the parameters are same as we have seen in mexico and uh, south african team so i won't repeat that so this model basically optimizes you know crop crop production land use patterns water and carbon stock exchanges and then you know it puts it in a partial equilibrium platform to see how you know we will be able to under these different pathways what are the you know what are the world views by 2030 2050 uh, next slide i will not go into the details of uh, the model or you know some of the results pictorially because uh, we you know you can access them and see that in our uh, fable synathon report which the links for which have already been shared and just quickly go through some of the results uh, what do we see so in a sustainable scenario to achieve some of these sustainable goals which meet our development targets uh if we actually you know we try to achieve the eat lancet recommendation dietary changes then we can actually achieve a reduction of a, a significant reduction of 761 uh you know uh, mt co2 per year additionally 310 mt co2 reduction can be achieved uh, apart from you know moving through dietary changes through improved livestock feed efficiency biofuel and afforestation targets if we meet our afforestation targets if we go for improved you know feed efficiency if we move towards biofuels uh, then you know it is possible to actually have additional uh, gains in terms of co2 reductions we also observe in 2050 a decrease in pasture land and cropland areas where the demand you know when 
the demand for plant based diets such as fruits vegetables nuts pulses and oils increase and the demand for dairy products poultry and sugar decrease so we actually see a significant improvement if we you know transition towards healthy diets where we move towards plant based diets and reduce the demand for dairy poultry and you know sugar uh, next slides please so uh, the minimum calorie requirements in terms of the food security in terms of the minimum dietary requirements as you know some of our colleagues already discussed uh, especially in the case of south africa uh, you know we know that india is also a highly inequal country so what happens to the food security situation so this can also be met uh, but not under high mitigation targets uh, so not under sustainable pathways but under the eat lancet current plus eat lancet pathways we can meet them Uh, so under moderate climate ambitions as per our results right now we can meet them uh, for that for all of this to happen water withdrawals in agriculture actually should reduce uh, by 11% by 2050 and how do we achieve water withdrawal reductions by actually shifting away from rice wheat and raw sugar so to sum up very simply transformations need to be planned in a way you know where we achieve or we move towards plant based diets uh you know uh, there is a use of second generation feedstock that is more biofuel you know as per the new biofuel policy of india uh, we have to reduce dependence on cereals and shift to water efficient crops uh, and uh, for example moving away from sugar can sugar uh, if we do these then we can actually achieve you know uh, in a healthy diet scenario we can achieve uh, we can we, we have a pathway towards a sustainable uh, transition by 2050 that is what you know we model we show through some in the complex data and uh, scientific uh, analysis uh, how do we connect uh, uh, next slide please how do we connect uh, with the policy makers where well, that's a challenging part uh, as we all know so what happens is you know there is of course uh, an increasing awareness and concern among policy makers about achieving sustainable agriculture and food transformations uh, there are two problems however one is that there are there is lack of scientific assessments and tools the lack of integrated tools uh, uh, so we have analysis which will probably look at the impacts of uh, you know water uh, uh, of of conservation in agriculture we'll be looking at for example shift towards uh, biofuels uh, uh, we will be looking at uh, you know different agricultural and food subsidies but there is hardly and so, and so on and so forth but there are hardly integrated tools which can actually produce assessments and results which talk across sectors so that is something which you know with our fable uh, uh, kind of an exercise we have been able to you know make a first attempt towards this and uh, wherever we have spoken to policy makers presented our results a, in a, in an informal or a formal setting uh, we have seen that there is a lot of excitement a, in terms of actually policy makers being able to see uh, having some view some uh, peak view into you know the next decades in terms of what you know how we need to move forward so there is an excitement and there is an understanding of that however uh, policy makers are also overwhelmed uh, and when i say policy makers uh, you know as we have also a very strong federal hierarchical structure but starting on from the central decision makers to the state decision makers to the bureaucrats to the political actors they are quite engaged with immediate objectives political objectives and we also uh, you know transition from a traditionally agrarian economy with very you know serious structural constraints in terms of you know the land uh, structure in terms of uh, you know the inequalities in terms of tenancy in terms of the sizes in terms of the migration issues uh, also in terms of you know the, the prices which go for cereal crops for grain crops there are value chain issues uh, where farmers where because india is a largely a small holder uh, farming country uh, in terms of not being able to connect to the end markets so there are a lot of important uh, policy issues which uh, you know and which are also of a near or short term goal which actually engage them so that's a challenge in terms of integrating our long term assessment results and you know trying to build up Uh, a narrative uh, where we can communicate these results in the context of what needs to be seen also in the short and the near term uh, so that is one challenge the other uh, you know uh, important challenge is that the environmental and the 
uh, climate policy makers, uh, the sustainability policy makers, those who engage, they also do not talk much to the agriculture and the food sector policy makers and the stakeholders and the actors. So there is that is another challenge to actually create platforms where we use these kind of scientific assessments, but also bring policy makers from different fora together where there is, there is a need for increasing communication between different different stakeholders and different sectoral policy makers. So that is one challenge uh, we are, of course, you know, witnessing. And this is but you know, the, it's, it's very nice to see that there is a very you know, there is a very um, uh, you know, there is a very positive response to this kind of work. And uh, moving forward, this is what we'll try to do to come up with more state of art assessments and communicate uh, with our policymakers uh, to move forward in achieving these targets. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. Thank you very much, uh, all the panelists and the participants and the audience. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ranjan. I'm going to ask if you can keep, you can just stay with your um, your uh, video on and then Odi and Charlotte, if you can join us as well. We are right at the top of the hour. So you all did perfectly in terms of your, um, in terms of following on time for your presentations. And now we have about half an hour to engage in some conversation and also to take some questions from the audience. And there's some really thoughtful questions in the chat so far. So we're gonna get to those in just a quick second. Let me pose just to each of you one quick question first. Um, and I think, Odi, I will start with you um, and just go in the order of those presentations. Um, you, you, in the, at the end of your presentation, you were talking a lot about, you know, even as we have models that demonstrate for us the opportunities for sustainable versus current or business as usual um, diets and pathways, that inequality is an important characteristic and important variable to rope into our modeling, especially in countries like, like South Africa, which are, which are so unequal. Um, my, my first question to you is, how would you suggest incorporating inequality into these models? So we're looking at not just what sustainable pathways look like, but how to achieve those sustainable pathways. Right, uh, I think that is a, a, a question that, um, um, would be best answered by working more closely with the with the stakeholders. So the in the fable process, uh, there's the modeling side of things where it's more technical, and there's a there's a there's a side which is really core developing the pathways with the stakeholders. And I think it matters a lot which stakeholders we bring into the room. Uh, to, I saw a question from from Fabrice uh, about uh, health and environment win wins, and I, and I immediately popped in my head that. Uh, we haven't actually, at least in our, in our, in our case here, not considered the health sector. <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge uh, um, an important sector to include in a conversation about diet. Uh, of course, we looked at their policy documents, but haven't brought them into the room. So already bringing the different voices in the room that, that uh, uh, represent these voices. And I think for, 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 um, uh, for equity, we, we also need to, to, to you know, Bring uh, well, an economist in the room as well, who at least here have people have, have done a really good uh, work of modeling equality and, and the trajectories about that. So, so I think it's 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 both a matter of bringing the, the right stakeholders in the room, uh, and not only your typical land connected stakeholders, um, as well as uh, on the technical side, thinking about how to incorporate more socioeconomic data. In, into the models. And I think these conversations have already started within the Fable Consortium. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you for that, Odi. And Charlotte or Ranjan, do either of you have a response to that as well? Uh, if I can just, you know, pitch in, I have nothing, you know, Odi has really answered it very well. So of course, you know, we are limited by data, we are limited by you know, the models uh, abilities to actually handle the complexities at a more granular high resolution levels because you know these are also tuned uh, to look at global pictures and this is an ongoing process which you know of course uh, we are moving towards that but uh, also in parallel we need to model farm level impacts and that is where uh, you know this this ultimate marriage of these two will give us really uh, stronger and you know a better idea. So uh, under the FSEC, we are 
and we are about to start working on something like a CLEM model, which is a crop, crop livestock enterprise model, which looks at really, and in collaboration with CSIRO, uh, which is going to model really the activities at uh, the farm unit level, where you know these complexities in terms of, you know, the inequalities are best reflected in, at least in the, agri in the agricultural sector, in terms of the endowments of land, in, in, in you know, how big or small a farmer is. So, you know, those uh, complexities will be captured when we try to actually model them at the farm level and then, you know, use outputs from that to actually feed into our more larger scale models to get better pictures. So this is, again, you know, this is a two-way process. And of course, you know, in the, as Odi said, uh, taking the stakeholders uh, and their inputs uh, all along. Brilliant, thank you. And just on that note of um, you know having multiple stakeholders around the table, which I think I think you're spot on, Odi and Ranjan. Um, Charlotte, you mentioned the cross sectoral platform that has been developed in Mexico. I think it was called Pisamac. Um, and this is one of the questions in the chat as well. Um, you know, you mentioned that it's not an agricultural issue, it's not environment, it's not health, it's not economy, it's all of the above. And the problem is recognized, but that we are still implementing solutions in these silos. Could you tell us a little bit more about that platform in Mexico, how you're seeing these sectors now begin to work together? Well, it's a very new platform. And along with that platform, platform being created, there have been some budget cuts across the federal government. So that means that some of the institutions that are part of this platform have, have had to reduce the amount of people who works in them. So what I know that is happening now, we have been in talk, um, in communication with some of the people that form part of this platform. And what we know is limited. Um, what we know is that they are doing some very important work, which is basically they are trying to change the dietary um, recommendations. So they are creating like the, the, um, like the food pyramid uh, by, but regionally, one of the problems that we have had and we have been very critical is that we have one food pyramid for a very culturally diverse country, which that doesn't work. But now they are doing it regionally. And they are collaborating with different institutions. So this food pyramid and um, these dietary recommendations are going to also change the food baskets, which are the main um, mechanism to create some of the incentives for agricultural production. So it's like a little chain, but that is happening really slow. And it's basically in hands of the institutions that form part of this because HISAMAC, the same platform, doesn't have a budget of its own. So the institutions that are part of it are using their budget to work and collaborate within, between them. We haven't seen any changes, um, nothing that we can appreciate yet, but they are still working on it and they are fairly new. They just started in 2019. So we are hoping that eventually they will have their own budget. And uh, we will be able, of course, we are hoping that we will be able to communicate with them and collaborate actively with them. Thank you, Charlotte. And then Ranjan, just one question to you, for you. You had some, um, at the end of your presentation, you were talking to us about how you've been able to connect the science and the research to policymakers. Um, you mentioned the lack of integrated tools being a challenge, but the fact that the tool and the model that you're producing, Fable, um, was actually able to create some excitement across, across sectors. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the experience that you've had working across these various sectors and any lessons that you might have learned about what is required in terms of dealing with uh, multi-stakeholder um, and multi-sectoral uh, um, groups of groups of stakeholders. Yes, uh, thank you, Rebecca. So, uh, so of course, you know, we are at a very initial phase because uh, our, uh, you know, our work has, uh, and it, it took some time to, of course, you know, set up uh, these uh, scientific tools. It has been going on for a few years, and uh, unless you know, uh, we would be able to. Uh, in, uh, to, to actually come to a level where we can confidently talk, uh, it's in itself been a journey. So in the meantime, in the this, this process, of course, it's a two-way process. So you know we have been participating in some of you know some some organized panels by some policy think tanks, some internal policy think tanks of the government, some in a civil society-driven scientific in you know, a policy think tanks, independent think tanks, and we have been presenting our results, and that is where you know the interactions happen very strongly. We have also been you know, uh, uh, talking to some state governments, because uh, we have to understand that in India, 
uh, the actual policy, the, the, the impactful policy actually happens at the state level. So we are a federal, you know, we have federal states, we have a central government, which basically lays down guidelines, uh, especially when it comes to the food and agriculture sector, because food and agriculture are state subjects. So it's the state departments and the governments which basically, uh, you know, have the ability to change, you know, the course of action. Uh, and coming down to more municipal level and district levels. So we have been in communication with some departments, uh, and uh, there is a very, you know, uh, uh, it, what of course is visible is that let's say the state agriculture department, uh, you know, is not very cognizant of what let's say the state integrated climate change plans are, or state integrated development in you know, a plans of which you know accounts for renewable energy, which accounts for sustainable food transitions. So we see a lot of you know uh, good actions, very you know well intended actions, but taking in silos in spaces. So that, that is something which we have observed, and wherever possible. Uh, we have presented that, of course, you know, there are, look at our results because, you know, so for example, uh, a biofuel policy would uh, be driven by, uh, let's say, the energy department, but that would have impact on what, you know, uh, coming down to the level of how farmers, that changes the terms of trade for the farmers in terms of what they're growing because that, you know, that shifts the incentives for whether they're going to use, uh, you know, the crop residues for feeding their livestock or they're going to sell it in the market for energy production. You see, so this is something which let's say an energy policy maker would not be worried about or concerned about before we would go and present some of these results. So although it has not been a lot and we are only beginning to do that because now we are at a, you know, we, we are having our scientific outputs uh, at, at some level of confidence, uh, but we can see that these uh, do, you know, create uh, conversation points. And I think this is a, a very good starting point. Brilliant. Excellent. I'm, I'm aligned um, in terms of taking the science down to the state level and working with state level actors. Uh, really important points. Great. So now we've got some fantastic questions in the chat, which I'm going to now um, uh, raise for you all. So this is in no particular order. So Ranjan, uh, Odi, and Charlotte, please feel free to answer these. But they're actually, the, the way that the questions are coming through the chat, they're kind of grouped into a couple of different topics. And the first topic I want to talk about is, is behavior change. Um, so we've been talking a lot about diets and, and the role that, diet, that, that dietary shifts can have um, in actually creating more sustainable pathways and food production, um, food production uh, transformation. Um, Charlotte just made a really interesting comment that we've got one food pyramid for such an, a, a vast array or a very diverse set of um, communities. So one question which is coming in from Fabrice is, does the food pyramid not work? Do we need to be better about including more local products within the categories of the pyramid? Likewise, another question is about um, dietary shifts. Dietary shifts are individual you know, decisions. How do you take a dietary shift to a meaningful national scale? Um, perhaps I, each of you would like to take a, a shot at this question or these questions. I can start with the pyramid. Um, I don't think that they work. Um, the problem is that, just to give an example, um, in Mexico, the northwestern part of Mexico is um, the land with no um, it's not culturally maize based, it's more wheat based. So in Mexico, um, most of the people, the, the cereals are eaten uh, by a, a, a corn tortilla. Um, we have corn and, and most of the country eats that. In the Northwestern, we don't have corn because we cannot grow enough corn to feed ourselves because it's too high. So we have other types of, of, of cereals that are eaten there. When you have only one, um, only one type of pyramid where you have a predominance of um, maize or cereals that are whole, for example, um, the tortilla that is corn is a whole uh, grain in the tortilla, but it's not the same for the uh, for the, the flour tortilla. The flour tortilla is made out of wheat with a lot of fat and a lot of um, um, refined 
a, a flower. So that means that the, the diet change needs to be different. The, the recommendation needs to be different. You cannot give the same recommendation because in some sense, the recommendation of cereal in the North, if it's based on the same pyramid that in the South, it means that you have more fat and more refined sugars, uh, refined carbohydrates in the North. So those changes, in those, those differences in the pyramid, it's not, it's not food pyramids now, there are um, plates. Um, those differences, those are important, but also they are important in what they mean when you teach children, when you advise people when they come to the health clinics and say what they need to eat. You cannot tell them you can eat five or six tortillas a day or two or three tortillas a day, because that's really different from the tortillas from the center of Mexico, which has whole grains. So that's just like an example of what I, what I meant with why it's important to have these um, regional um, food pyramids and, and, and dietary recommendations so people can understand what is being told to them exactly what they, they should be reducing and what they should be increasing. Ranjan or Dr. Odi? Yeah. I just, you know, maybe, you know, before Odi comes in, just briefly add to, I completely agree with Charlotte is, uh, you know, and I don't think India is very different in that sense from Mexico. We have immense dietary diversity in the country. Uh, and that dietary diversity actually is, you know, every, uh, I mean, there's a saying that every hundred kilometers in India, or uh, let's say, you know, hundred miles in India, uh, the, the language and the food changes. So we have to be very conscious and conscientious about uh, you know the proposals we make because as i said it's there are a lot of inequalities there is food security but there is also some kind of preference for food so eventually as we you know move forward uh, our scientific assessments have to go downscale uh, you know a, and you know have to go down uh, and you know do ground truthing in a sense that it accounts for the production system of a particular region because that's also very agroclimatic you know, dependent, but and also the consumption system. So there has to be a match in that, and then so therefore, what, what one thing we are planning uh, is to not only look at eat landscape because this is the first round of the uh, assessments which we have done, but to actually look at the local, uh, you know, Nutrition Institute of India, uh, NIN guidelines. So basically, you know, we are trying to integrate in the next stage those guidelines and look very specifically for what would work in India. Uh, so this is, I think, the way forward where we actually have to contextualize and uh, come up with assessments uh, which account for these diversities. That makes a lot of sense. And then, Odi, um, just on the, uh, continuing on this topic of diet and behavior change, um, please, of course, if you have an answer to that question um, on the food pyramids, um, do, do provide it. But there's a question in here that's coming from Peter Haring. Um, and I thought that you might be particularly well placed to answer this, given that South Africa, as you mentioned in your chat, is, is, is uh, known for heavy meat consumption. He's asked, what are the views in your country with respect to less meat consumption, while meat consumption is often seen as a status symbol? Even in the Netherlands, where Peter is living, there is a strong opposition, for instance, to increasing the tax on meat. So give your thoughts on, on, on that and how, again, this relates to the question before of how to actually create these behavior shifts um, to match up with these more sustainable diets? Right, I mean, uh, that's a very good question and, and, a, and a particularly controversial one here in South Africa, uh, uh, in part because people make this argument from cultural perspectives, uh, in other parts from, uh, this is a, we, we are in a dryland system uh, predominantly. Uh, what that also means is that our climate is more suited to growing meat, so to speak, uh, than to growing some crops. So uh, if I take South Africa, for example, it's a water scarce country. So we, 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 we actually can't grow all of the stuff we need to. So in some sense, trade needs to be, um, uh, trade, then trade becomes important as a, as a way to meet the, the demand for some of these crops. So the argue, I think, I think the, the to, to me, this speaks to, to a few things I think, two things that uh, uh, both Ranjan and Charlotte uh, spoke to, but another one of, can, can, can we do an assessment of whether we have, we, we are capable uh, both climatically um, and, and in other ways to produce what we need to, to this, this alternative diet, for this alternative diet. And if we are not, where are we going to look 
too for that. And we know that this um, uh, this other risks that come with the with the interdependence uh, and food of food systems and uh, if something breaks, you know, the, this this vulnerability that's built into uh, dependence on on other faraway places and uh, things can change both. It's, it's a pandemic or it's a, a political change where trade restrictions change. So, so it, it, then it comes with a lot of other implications, how you, um, if you outsource all your, 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 your staples elsewhere. So I think there's a real conversation that's needed about security and, um, and, and then we can talk about behavior change. So, and maybe to touch quickly on the behavior change question, I think somebody said this is an in, a predominantly individual um, uh, endeavor. I, I, I do agree, but in some, on, in, some, in some sense, it is not in a sense of, um, if I look at sugar content in foods, yes, that is way too high and that can be regulated. So it's not, a, it's not something that people can necessarily uh, change themselves, but it can be regulated that food content in, in, in food should be less, thanks. Fantastic, great, great point. Yes, Ranjan. Yeah, so can I just add a couple of quick points to what Odi also said in terms of uh, coming back to the question of India. We, you know, India, uh, if you look at you know, the traditional diet of India is largely vegetarian. It's one of those unique you know countries which are largely in you know, a vegetarian based diet, plant based diets already. So here, one unique challenge we would be facing is to because you know of course we know historically data that as a country you know moves up in the economic development and growth curve, then, you know, there is larger dairy livestock consumption. And, you know, so more protein consumption actually comes from the livestock sectors. So that's a challenge, you know, we are, we would be facing in terms of not actually currently, if, uh, it, it's more about currently the problems is not, you know, it's, it's about uh, more about the balance of the macronutrients. It's about getting protein from the right sources, but it's also about the access to the right kind of protein. Because this is an economic problem, this is a socio-cultural, this is socio-economic issue. So access to good food is, of course, a, a, a problem. We need to be, again, you know, conscious and include that uh, as we move forward. Coming to the point of the trade, I think you know, I should have mentioned earlier, but thanks to Odi for reminding, is that you know, we also have to be conscious in terms of our self-sufficiency. So in our models, we see that you know, it's not very easy to meet the self-sufficiency goals in a normal uh, even in the current or current plus eat scenario, or, uh, sorry, in the sustainable scenario. So if you go for a high climate ambition, we are actually becoming net importers on some of the food crops where we are actually currently uh, self-sufficient. So we need to have really, you know, in, uh, uh, in a very thought out carved policies, which uh, uh, what we are doing here is we are actually saying that, look, if you want to achieve, you know, the sustainable goals by 2050 on this path where we are doing fine on many things, but you know, we are not doing so well in terms of self-sufficiency. So how do we do? We do some policy changes, right? And our models are being able to connect, you know, bring the trade angles because our, these are integrated models where we are looking at the, the, the relations of India's trade with let's say Southeast Asia or China or, you know, other parts of the world in terms of both imports and exports. So we really are giving, you know, we are being able to come up with some deeper insights, but they will require, uh, you know, a, a bold policy, <clears throat> Uh, and thoughtful policy changes. Thank you. Yes, and that indeed relates to exactly what um, what John Paul was saying in his response on the question about trade and the very important role that um, that it has to play. In. And that's exactly what I was trying to get at when I was asking him about that about that topic. Is that in certain scenarios you could actually become net importers, and then what does that what does that trade off mean for any particular country? As we're talking about trade-offs, that's the next set of questions. So let me just ask these last two questions quickly before we before we wrap. So one question is coming in from Pana Giotis uh, about the global poultry market, which is expected to actually increase from 2020 to 2021. So he's asking if we consider and implement policies that reduce meat consumption, like poultry, for example, how would we minimize trade-offs for engaging for those that are engaged and are employed um, in this industry? Likewise, there was a question from um, Fabrice that had already been answered about how the production sector um, responds to these types of, um, of, of policy recommendations on behavior, behavior on dietary change. Um, any quick thoughts from either of you on those on those two questions? 
just quickly to say that, uh, I mean, it's not really an answer to that question, but but to say that, I mean, this is a real concern. I think um, that this will have an impact also on, on the feed industry in the world, but is uh, feeding all the, the animals that we're eating. So I think that conversation uh, also also means bringing industry into this conversation in terms of what, what are the mechanisms for, for, for adaptation in those sectors. Um, you know, it, when 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 uh, people talk about transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy, there's a lot of talk about just transition. I think it's not just transition; it's not just a climate issue. And Ranjan or Charlotte, any thoughts on that? You're on mute. Yes. Uh, Charlotte, maybe you would like to go. No, I think that Odi was very clear. Uh, I just want to uh, um, make a, a, a small um, comment. So in Mexico, um, there is a difference of who eat meat and who doesn't. And most of the urban population who have um, higher income, they are able to um, consume red meat much more often. That also goes for chicken. Um, for poultry, um, but there are also a large amount of population, mostly women in rural and urban in, impoverished areas that have no access uh, to red meat. So that means that um, they are also iron, they have iron deficiency. So in Mexico, when we look at what are where the transitions in diet, are, in diet related to red meat, what we saw is that there is not a drastic reduction of consumption of meat just because there is large population that needs that red, red meat to be able to acquire in a more efficient way the iron that it needs is, is needed. Um, so I do understand that there are some very difficult decisions that need to be made in terms of economic transitions and economic um, um, effects of what happens when you stop producing enough meat. In the case of Mexico, um, we have, we model trying to import quality meat from, uh, from places that are much more sustainable in their production and to try to make our own production sustainable and that has helped. But still, there are large areas uh, of the country where they need a, more, a better consumption of, of protein, of animal protein. Thank you, Charlotte. So we've got just about two or three minutes left in the session. So let me just ask the final question that's come in from the, from the audience to you three. And it's about targets, which is a very fitting way for us to end. So Gerhard has asked, um, and I believe uh, somebody has already taken a shot at answering this, about um, land use and land use change and forestry greenhouse gas emissions targets. To what extent, if any at all, um, should requirements be obligatory? And he's also asked whether or not there are, the EU has recently adopted some regulations on, on emissions for land use and land use change. Are there any other countries, perhaps the countries that you all are calling in from with actual ambitions uh, on land use emissions reductions? Anyone like to take a stab at this on emissions targets? Um, yeah, I, I can do The problem is that I don't remember the target. I, Mexico um, has um, committed to have by 2030, if I remember correctly, a very specific target I think is um, net zero uh, greenhouse emissions. That's a very ambitious. I mean, 10 years from now, nine years from now, we are committed to that. Um, it, that requires a, a very big changes. Along with that, we have a very ambitious targets uh, of, of, of um, reduction of our impact on the environment. Um, but as I said before, um, that's all very well in paper. Um, that's all very well in law. Uh, it's the, the, in, the, um, what happens in reality is that um, it's not clear how it's going to be achieved. Of course, they are working on that and probably in a couple of months, we will see a very clear pathway of how we are going to achieve that, hopefully with the help of Fable Mexico. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Great. Well, go ahead, Odi. I was just going to say, just for South Africa, we 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 are seeing more of this defined in 
sort of like a climate strategy that is from the agriculture department or environmental department, but I haven't seen them yet make their way into the NDC, for example. So I think that is still a step that needs to, to happen for those to actually become uh, targets that, that we can start monitoring. So again, you know, I'll just quickly, I mean, I think probably the last point, we have also, you know, afforestation and net zero deforestation targets by 2030. And we have tried to, you know, include them in our models. But again, as I said, you know, as just piggybacking on what Charlotte has said, is that we will have to basically, you know, account for uh, the fact that it will require very, uh, you know, important, you know, livestock efficiency increases, very important. Uh, you know, agricultural production efficiency increases, uh, which actually, you know, creates this balance between crop, land expansion, pasture land expansion, and, you know, meat production and the entire transition we have been talking about. So, uh, because that will have, of course, a very important link with the forestry targets. Uh, so that is, again, uh, what uh, an integrated uh, tool uh, we are trying to work around with. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much to all three of you and to Jean-Paul, who is, I think he's left us by now. Um, but we're at the top of the, of the not the hour, at the half hour. So we, we are um, just finishing up on the session. I want to thank you all for such a fantastic discussion. And thank you for all of the uh, audience members who pose questions to the panelists. We've talked about how modeling in this space of, of food transformation has been improving. And I think the three of you through your, through your presentations really showed us how we're becoming more integrated in, in, in terms of the models that are being built now um, to address food transformation. But we also discussed some of the ways that modeling tools can need to continue to improve. And, and for myself as a, as a research director, I really thoroughly appreciated that conversation, you know, about needing to um, expand the tools so that they can incorporate equity and access and really reach down to the local farm level of impacts. We also talked about uh, the need to engage multi-stakeholder um, groups um, and that there is some progress being made at this in this in this space, but you know, continuing to do better and, and push this even to the state level. Um, and then of course, this last bit of conversation around behavior change, trade-offs and targets showed us that there is still a very live uh, national and community level conversation that's happening that we need to be cognizant of. So I want to thank you all for your participation, um, both to our panelists, a round of applause to you and to our, to our um, audience. Thank you so much for engaging. Um, I, uh, on behalf of AFSEC and Fable and UNECA, we'd just like to thank you all for being part of, of today's conversation. And um, Grace or, or Maria, who are our organizers for today. Again, thank you so much for your organization behind the scenes. If there's anything that you'd like to say to everyone before we all sign off, this is the time to do so. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Excellent work to the speakers and the moderator and uh, have a good rest of the day. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All. Thank you. Pleasure to be thank here. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.